Hello, this is Professor Gavor. We're going to cover Chapter 2 of the uh, McKean and Smith book, Developing IT Strategy for Business Value. It's really an extension of what we covered in Chapter 1. And if we look at it, you know, the importance of IT is, you know, they're kind of like the filter, the threshold across which new technologies enter an enterprise. Uh, technology is changing all the time, the computer capabilities. And, you know, by the time you read about it in a trade magazine, other people are already using it. So one of the things you want to look at for new technologies, do you want to make sure that it's proven and other people have checked it out? Or do you want to be the first guy in a block to, to have it in your company? And it really, that's kind of embedded in one's corporate culture, I believe. So new technologies, as they say here, co-involve with new business strategies and changes in the business environment. It allows companies to be much more global. It allows all of us to work remotely as we are now in this COVID pandemic thing. And um, the strategies of IT and business must be complementary. In fact, they may have to be in lockstep. If they're at opposition to each other, uh, IT might know the best thing to do, but if they can't convince the business folks that that is the best thing to do, well, then it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen effectively. And if the business people do not have some IT savvy about them, um, they're basically at the mercy of their IT department to do what they want. And sometimes you don't get the best results that way. So I guess when you talk about business and IT strategy, uh, the strategy should support IT strategy should support the business strategy. Well, heck yes, I believe in that. And I don't think that's ever going to change. Uh, probably has to be integrated with it now is uh, what has to happen. The contribution of IT was uh, oftentimes inhibited by limited understanding of business strategy. I will still see an executive these days that will tell me something like, uh, yeah, we could... Uh, we could get on Microsoft Teams, but I don't know how to use that, so I'll have my secretary set it up. Um, back in the 1990s, for sure in 1980, that was more prevalent. In 1990, I still saw on a train coming from New York to my home in Connecticut, uh, executives that would have had their secretaries print out all their emails, and they would review them on the train making notes with a pen on the on the printed paper and then give them to the secretary the next day who would then respond to all the emails. I mean, it's, it's like insane that that was even happening then. But there's still cases where that could be the, the, the way business is done now, even though I think it's happening less and less. IT's contribution was inhibited by the limited understanding of IT's potential by business managers. That definitely is historical. I think there's that gap has closed a lot. The current view is it has to be integrated. That's probably where I stepped out of the business world and into the teaching world. Uh, it has to be positioned for flexibility and speed and innovation to support rapidly changing business environment. And let's face it, uh, globalization and doing more with less people. Let's never forget that aspect of it. Uh, and investments in technology have to complement the business strategy. As I said in the previous chapter, and as probably no IT book has ever said, um, it has to be a parallel to the capital budgeting process. Now, here at the future view, they say it has to become more dynamic and focused on developing strategic capabilities that support a variety of changing business objectives. Well, how does that work? How do you have that visionary scope? And hopefully you want business people to say that. I remember when I used to travel the world and use basically dial-in to do email. I don't know if any of you remember having to ever have to do dial-in. But I told our IT people, I have a vision now, I wasn't high enough in the company to make that division a reality, but I would tell my IT friends that were my peers, 
this all the time. My vision is I want to plug my computer, my laptop, into a portal in any place I go in the Colgate world, because it was Colgate Palmolive, and it would think I was at my desk and I would get my email and internet access and everything instantaneously. And that took about four years before we had that capability, but we got that capability. And then quickly after that, we went to a Wi-Fi capability and leapfrogged even what I thought was possible. So I think this future view is kind of like in the spirit of, of that that I was saying, that you, you've got to have the business and IT looking to say, what do we want to do next? What would maybe streamline our business more? What would enable us to reduce the number of headcount because fewer people could do so much more? And that's the kind of areas you'd want to look at. So IT and business alignment will not be point in time planning. It will support evolutionary change. I think it's already doing that. One of my favorite ideas is shared service organizations, which took off like a rocket. Uh, there's four critical success factors here. You have to know your business model, first of all. You have to have some strategic themes. So really, to know your business model and have some strategy set is a higher level functioning company. Uh, companies that just worry quarter to quarter are not thinking this way and are probably going to be more reactive in their IT strategy. You have to have the right people involved. And the IT folks have to work in partnership with business. I think all of these are important. I would say definitely three and four for sure. So revisit your business model. What are we talking about? A business model tells us how different pieces fit together. In fact, uh, there's a wonderful article by Peter Drucker that I will try to dredge up and post in this week's readings on what, know your business model. Uh, it should be clear and describe the unique value that the organization can deliver. So it's kind of like the value proposition of the various business. And it's not so simple as that because a complicated business maybe have different value propositions and different um, organizational divisions and aspects. IT strategy is about crafting these programs that focus on specific business capabilities. Where do you want to excel? Where do you want to differentiate yourself in the marketplace? It's almost like a product design. If you don't know, have a strategy for where you want to take your product design, you will end up with something, I don't know what you'll end up with. But, you know, you can see a company like Apple having more of that. Uh, they've moved from innovation, though, to line extensions, uh, if you ask me, since uh, Steve Jobs passed away. And I think we're looking at group these projects and programs and strategic themes that are easy to track and support interdependencies. Well... Gee whiz, it's hard to argue with that, isn't it, when I word it that way. But the point is, if you have a business strategy, your IT needs to be in lockstep with that business strategy. And getting to the point where IT innovations could influence your business strategy. And it takes a visionary non-IT leader to be able to see that. So you need the right people involved. Well, much like if you're talking about capital budgeting, which I keep harping on that, um, senior management has to be involved in capital budgeting so that you have the right plants in the right place and the right warehouses at the right level of modernization and at the right sizes to support your business. Well, you need the same thing for IT. And senior management has to be involved. And they have to not be set in their ways because if they're set in their ways, they'll always be thinking about doing things the way they always did it, not the way things could be done as technology changes. And let's face it, cha technology changes relatively rapidly. Uh, key stakeholders need to be involved in determining technology opportunities. Well, the senior management are your key sponsors and stakeholders. The difference between a sponsor and a stakeholder in project management 
is the sponsor is the person that's directly responsible for getting it done. Not doing the work himself, but the senior most executive that is responsible for having the project completed in which he has a project manager and a project team that are actually going to do the work. The stakeholders are peer levels to the sponsor. So there are also other senior mem um, management team members, but they uh, don't have direct responsibility but need to be involved in order for their people in arguably different functional areas to be involved in the project. Uh, some companies have accomplished this through account manager positions. Uh, I've seen it matrixed and my, my frame of reference is probably Colgate Palmolive where I worked the longest and most recent, even most, you know, I left there in 2007, but I have kept in touch and seen the kind of things they do. They are matrix. They have account IT people in charge by functional area and by geographical region. So, and more and more the functional, as, as the geographical regions become less important in terms of computing and IT, the functional account manager has risen. We used to have all only divisional IT people, geographical IT people, but they have waned as functional people have become more popular. IT has enabled Colgate to run the world from functional leadership, not so much general management in various geographical areas, even though they're still there and still important. This will be revealed more as we uh, progress through this course. The IT people have to work in partnership with the business. We, I think we've pounded that statement in the first chapter, and, and, and again, we'll hammer it home here. Um, both have to have input into the strategy. Business knows what they want the business to do. IT knows what's capable from an IT standpoint. You need both sides of the page, both pages of the book there to be able to do this. So IT projects should be synchronized with business objectives. And we've talked about that also. So there's five dimensions of IT strategy. There's business improvement. So you're looking at low-risk investment, short- to medium-term payback, and a focus is on streamlining business processes. That's all what the ERP era was about, and implementing ERP systems. Let's get this payback. Let's streamline. Let's get the best practices involved everywhere and a business process focus. My, my, my career is rooted in business process and manufacturing process and improvement of those processes quality improvement. So I, I look at this as just fundamental way of, of operating. And I even think, even you talk about stress, relatively low risk investment, short to medium term payback, this is never going away in any IT project. You're always talking about the business process and how it works. I suppose that the more you've automated and the later generations of automation that you're implementing, probably the changes are not so dynamic, but I can't promise you that. Uh, business enabling. Well, it transforms or extends how a company does business. Typically focused on revenue growth, cost benefit is usually not as clearly established. Um, well, business enabling. We're still talking about how business gets done, how a company does business. These are still business processes, my friends. Uh, I, I, you can't convince me otherwise. So, but what we're talking about here is rather than you know streamlining business processes, maybe in a more local sense, in a more functional sense, we're talking about how we can do it on a larger scale, perhaps, and get better results faster. And by results, we're talking, they say they're typically focused on revenue growth, could also be cost reduction. A lot of IT projects 
are about doing more with less people more effectively. And the people are on the cost side. Business opportunities. Well, small-scale experimental initiatives here are designed to test new concepts and technology. You know, this whole world of apps. We have an app for this. We have an app for that. Let's develop an app for something that we do uniquely in our company that no one else kind of does. And if we can do that, will that app help us um, sell better? Will it help us uh, process orders faster? Will it help us manage suppliers better? All of these things. So this is when I talked in, in chapter one about you want some small budget in functional and geographical entities where you're allowing people to go out and try different things. And as they try different things within the larger strategy, mind you, like you can't all of a sudden like have a small group say, listen, we're tired of Oracle. We want to implement SAP. No, Oracle is our answer. But in your functional area, if you want to implement this new warehouse management system from Oracle, that's not the standard that we've been using, the old, you know, the staid warehouse management system from Oracle. Give it a shot. Let us know how it differs and how it, if it's better. And if we should, so this is like your seed projects to see, hey, let's try this and see if this is something we want to implement around the world. Now, your user base, your functional leadership that knows a lot about what's going on are the best people to maybe come up with these ideas can we try this? Can we do that? You don't want to do it outside of the IT strategy because there's still a dimension of IT strategy. That's a good way to get fired. I saw a purchasing executive that was just hell-bent on implementing some purchasing software that was outside of the IT strategy and pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed and, pushed and finally spent some money because he had the authorization um, for that kind of spend without the checks and balances of, oh, this is IT, you can't spend it that way. He spent some money, a lot of money on it, and he got fired for it. So it still has to be done in concert, but you want to give the people in functional areas some freedom to explore. Opportunity leverage. So now we're talking about leverage of successful experiments or prototypes. Technology is easy to imitate. Some initiatives may leverage the result of other companies. It's easy to look at somebody else and say, look what they're doing. How are they doing that? Let's go find out. If it's an IT solution that's not homegrown, that they didn't develop themselves, they bought it from somewhere. And usually the companies that provide the IT solutions are boasting who their customers are. So you find out who's doing that for your competitor, and then you can explore and see if their functionality in their software is superior to what you're using. If it is, you may consider switching if it fits your strategy. Or, like in the past element, if you have a small-scale test in your own entity and find that it's successful, then you leverage it and roll it out on a larger scale. Um, the, my previous company, Colgate, was really, really good at doing this. And in fact, we leveraged, you know, I was part of some of these kind of activities in my entities that I was managing in, in the logistics world to look at transportation management, look at warehouse management, and even some quality management, and then roll it out to the rest of the company once they saw the kind of success we were getting. And lastly is infrastructure. Now, this is, I love this slide because says operating level hardware and software must be maintained, typically not well understood by business managers. I don't want to get involved in the nuts and bolts. This is like my PC doesn't work. I'm not unscrewing the, the case, opening it up, and doing the diagnostics. I'm going to call someone from IT and say, come here and fix it. So this is the part where IT really has to support the business in a way <clears throat> that business doesn't need to be involved. It's the bits and bytes. It's the hardware. It's the 
graphics card, if you will, if, uh, on a PC, but on a larger scale, because you're talking about where are our, our servers? Are we cloud-based? Are we not cloud-based? And, uh, you know, cybersecurity, all of these other things that IT is responsible for that really you, they can lose the rest of the business quickly by getting into uh, terminology and nomenclature that they're not familiar with. Now, I need to know something about cybersecurity. I need to know something about data management. I need to know something about contracts for, with, with, with PC companies, where we're buying our PCs, what office suite we're using, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't need to be involved in a day-to-day -day maintenance and installation of that. But I do, as a business leader, need to be involved in the budgeting process for it. Okay. So IT strategy development, what's the best practices? Uh, well, you have a rolling planning and budget cycles. They sh here they say they should be updated more than once a year. Uh, and, and that's absolutely true. But there is that cycle called the budgeting cycle. And that's your big moment to do these kinds of things. Now, if you have other projects that you see coming, you can get pre-approval. Like, let's say we need, a where we need to upgrade a manufacturing line. I got to go out and buy a lot of equipment. And guess what? Senior management, we're going to put this in a capital budget for next year. And right now it's May. And next year, the capital budget process starts in October. But here we've done all the legwork for it. Can we get pre-approval? And so they will pre-approve it, not too many, but they will pre-approve things as needed as it depends on the, the, the health and strategic value it brings to the business for capital budget. The same thing applies to the IT budget. It's probably the big moment is, and again, in October when you do all your budgeting, including uh, geographical uh, business cost center budgeting and profit center budgeting. And now you're going to do your capital budgeting and your IT budgeting at the same time. But if you have a need for IT expenses in between, you would have that pre-approval also. So it's kind of rolling with the big hump of it being during the normal budgeting process, at least at the consumer products companies I've worked for. An enterprise architecture. So we're consisting of integrated business and IT blueprint. So as a business goes, the, the IT needs to go. As the IT goes, the business may need to follow, depending on where the innovation is coming from first. And this has to be an ongoing discussion. Uh, funding the different buckets. We talked about five different kinds of buckets. You want to look at those buckets and decide you're not going to have all strategic processes. You're going to have some business process improvement. You're going to have some leveraging processes. You're going to have all of these things. And you put them all, propose them all, put them on a table, rank order them, uh, estimate the return on investment the best you can. And then from that rank order, you're going to pick the ones that you can afford. And the ones you can't afford may never get done. Or you may say, try to do this out of your local budget if possible. So account or relationship managers <clears throat> are used to identify these synergies and interdependencies. They have a, a lot of power, but they work in lockstep. Like if I was in charge of global logistics and customer service for a consumer products group, so basically the VP of global supply chain, I would have a finance person assigned to me. I would probably also have, and a matrix organization, the finance person wouldn't report to me directly. They would report to the CFO, but they would be on my staff. And I would also have an IT person probably assigned to me but uh, and on my staff, but not directly reporting to me. They would report to the CIO, the Chief Information Officer. Together, this is where this kind of work happens. So that account or relationship manager 
would be my director or VP of IT that would report to me for my functional needs. He wouldn't report directly to me. It would be a dotted line. All right. So you have a prioritization rubric. Ooh, geez, just like the rubrics I use to grade your papers. Uh, what are we talking about here? IT, to get the best practices in, in this, you want how to prioritize. And we talked about it before. Is it strictly ROI? Is it impact on the top line, the bottom line? The answer is yes. It depends on the company. Some companies are more focused on top line performance. Others, bottom line performance. Others are looking on return on investment. Colgate Palmolive, return on investment. So it had to pay. I didn't care if it was top line, bottom line. If you raise the top line, you're going to impact the bottom line. If you impact the bottom line directly by removing costs, well, obviously you impact the bottom line. So your return on investment is based on when it all comes down to it. How does how do your how does this project impact the profitability? of the company. I mean, I don't know any other way to do it than that. So barriers to effective IT strategy and development. Well, you need a governance structure. And in fact, there's a whole chapter on, or there's a whole section of this book on governance. And there's enterprise-wide funding models, which I think I've outlined in the previous lecture on this one, pretty decently. There's parallel and linked resources for developing IT and business strategies. Um, how are they parallel? I have seen an evolution to more centrally controlled. And there's traditional budget cycles. Well, I've just added, as I've mentioned before, the IT budgeting and prioritization process uh, I've created a shadow budget, budgeting methodology equivalent to capital budgeting, and here we go. And in fact, probably the capital budget and the IT budget are put in one bucket, and, and senior management has decided how much they want to spend on each. I would imagine uh, over the past 20 years, the IT capital budget, if you will, has grown dramatically at the expense somewhat of the capital budget, the non-IT capital budget. That's probably a good study for someone to do for a master's or PhD thesis. So barriers to effective IT strategy development. You want to balance strategic and tactical initiatives. If you're working on strategy and people are choking to death tactically and in their daily work, it's not going to work. So you'd have to have some skills in developing business strategy and incorporate them here. What are we trying to do? Not lose sight of what you're trying to do, but making sure you take care of the short term and the long term simultaneously. I would imagine all strategic projects are probably a little bit on hold in this, you know, as I'm recording this during the COVID pandemic era. And people are worrying about tactical things. How can we reduce our workforce? How can we leverage IT? I mean, coming out of um, the Great Recession was one of the great leaps also, I believe, in IT effectiveness and efficiency. Streamlining the business processes because many companies shed their workforce and were forced to have to improve their IT capabilities or not only their capabilities, but the effectiveness of the capabilities they already had. So, enough said there. So in conclusion, if IT strategy is gaining attention by business. It has gained the attention of business on, on a larger scale. And some smaller companies, and uh, I think there's a, a students in this class that work for smaller entities where this is probably still needs to be done. Most organizations are at the early stage of integrating IT strategy with business strategy. I don't know uh, how to validate that statement. I would think at the large scale, Fortune 500 companies, they've probably made tremendous advances in that regard. 
smaller companies, the, the smaller as you move towards mom and pop and family run businesses, uh, you know, maybe still $50 million or $100 million in sales, which is nothing to laugh at, but they're smaller companies and they're maybe $10 million in sales need to do that. They don't know the capabilities even of the software they're already running. A lot of small companies will put in, um, you know, it's hard to put in a separate general ledger system anymore. Most general ledger systems are an ERP system of some sort. Even QuickBooks has evolved. Many small companies are running themselves on QuickBooks and many people have QuickBooks <clears throat> to run their general ledger, but are not taking advantage of all the other bells and whistles there. So that happens a lot. And you want to balance your IT solutions with business strategy. So that's where we're at. Thank you very much for paying attention. A couple more videos coming this week.